South Africa is filled with all kinds of animals, but how many of you have heard of this one, the African wild dog, also known as the African painted dog because of its unique coat? You may have not heard of them because this species has been seen as a pest to the region, so much so they've been hunted to near extinction. But now conservationists are working towards building the pack's biodiversity and ultimately saving the species. This next film by director Emily Cross is called Part of the Pack. Make sure to stick around after the credits to hear from the filmmaker herself. The African wild dog is listed as an endangered species on the IUCN red list. It's the most endangered carnivore in South Africa. A large part of the problem is the history and the perceptions that wild dogs carry. There's only 550 wild dogs left in the whole country. They live in family groups that are collaborating their hunting strategy. They help each other. They protect each other. There's this level of social structure and energy that really builds a pack and keeps the cohesion within them. The more time you start spending with them, you start learning the different personalities within the pack, the different roles and responsibilities that the pack members share. That kind of emotional intelligence is something that really draws me to them. The wild dog are the great hunters and they have a nice collaboration when they're doing their hunt. You get a particular individual that is right by the prey, and when that particular individual tires out, he pulls off to the edge of the line and the others come in so that they keep that persistent pace. And then the young stars also help the pack to hunt and help to feed the puppies during the training season. Whatever they've killed, they would eat something, swallow it, they would run kilometers back to the den and regurgitate for the puppies. I think it's a very unique system, especially in the African bush where they've got a million other challenges, but they'll put their pack members first. There's so many different threats and a, and a real history of persecution to the African wild dogs. They were seen as vermin. People were receiving financial rewards for killing wild dogs in South Africa. Wild dog territory was completely reduced right across the country. So it kind of shows the kind of urgency we have to conserve the species. The main problem would be human beings. Uh, the snares are being put in a place that you can't really get to patrol every day. And even outside the park, then it's like 15 to 20 snares in a kilometre radius or whatsoever. The animal is just running through without anticipating anything and all of a sudden this thing catches it. You actually most likely to lose the entire pack if they go through a snared area. We've had cases where a wild dog's been snared and it's been removed from the pack and placed in captivity for rehabilitation. And often that wild dog does quite fine with getting rehabbed and then suddenly takes a turn for the worst a few days later. And in post-mortems, we found that the severity of stress being away from the pack, and even something that we nicknamed broken heart syndrome, are things that wild dogs really do suffer from. And without the pack and without that cohesion, it's, it's a big struggle for them. They've existed this long because they live and die for their pack. Wild dogs disperse to find new territories and to start packs of their own. It's an adaption that ensures genetic variability, but the problem with this is that they are adapted to traveling very far distances. This causes breakouts out of the park. A dog running 20 kilometers in a space of two hours, getting to understand how far they could actually extend in search for partners. So they often pass through communities, commercial farmlands and highways, and in doing that they land up often becoming roadkill too. And if they encounter communities 
they kind of find a way of actually avoiding it. Should we just be saying, let's open up passages for them to actually move through so that they can be able to find a chance to live in some other places or if they do find a suitable land, then they would settle there. The two main objectives that we have within conserving wild dogs in South Africa and in Southern Africa, in fact, number one, maintain what we have and number two, restore what we've lost. That in itself even includes the genetic translocations between the reserves. Simply putting wild dogs in one reserve and, and thinking we've done our job is not the case. Once those pups are born within that pack and they start wanting to breed, we have to ensure that they're breeding with wild dogs that are far related from them. We want to increase the population numbers, which includes the pack numbers and the individual numbers, and also increase the genetic diversity within the wild dogs. The more dogs fitted with tracking collars, the better for the wild dog population of South Africa. Collars need to be under a certain weight in order to be fitted onto a wild dog. Programmed to log four points a day. This gives us consistent data throughout the time of the collar being on the animal. Information on habitat utilization, population demographics, poaching and snaring incidents, as well as potential breakouts out of the park. We can then use that database within the country to pair up the best dogs and ensure that the best genetics are coming through and increasing that genetic diversity. Educating from grassroots level, from the kids up and getting them to know about wild dogs and grow a love and a passion for wild dogs. Educational in a way, the community starts learning, hey, these animals aren't as dangerous as we thought they were. So just the fact that a, a wild dog has the ability to choose a den and then ensure that the sick, the injured and the young are fed first and looked after and that the fittest dogs will eat at the end, for me says everything we need to know about wild dogs and in fact it's something that I think as humans we almost need to take a page out of their book. Dead pack formation teaches you something and you hope you would see families live like that. You would hope you would see communities coming together. And surely as we are putting efforts into conserving the species, if we get community buy-ins and local farmers buying in, it would actually be formalizing a greater pack system that we've actually observed from these creatures. And in that extent, we would be having at least a combined society towards conservation. When you change the mindset and the perceptions, then you get to a point of saying, hey, I've done something. We've got hope. Now let's talk to Emily Cross about how she fell in love with these painted creatures. Uh, so my name is Emily Cross and I'm a conservation and wildlife filmmaker as well as a full-time production manager in the advertising world in Durban, South Africa. It started actually in 2015. Um, I went to um, a game reserve in Zululand called Makuzi and um, I would go there once a year with my family and um, 
It's actually a funny story. I started speaking with this wildlife act monitor who uh, is there to monitor endangered species. They mentioned how they were there monitoring the leopards and the wild dogs. And I'd never heard of wild dogs before. And she said, um, you know, actually, if you like go down this road at this time, like just turn off your car and just wait and you might see them. So we jump in the car and we go. I'll never forget it. Like we turned the corner and there was just grass and literally there was nothing. So we turned the car off and we waited and there was just short, short grass and there was absolutely nothing. So we're talking, talking and then all of a sudden you start seeing these white flicks like through the grass and we had no idea what these things were kind of thing. And next thing, like 30 wild dogs got up out of the grass, like where we couldn't see them at all before and they got up and we were able to watch them for about 40 minutes, which is also super rare. First that pack size and then like the duration of the moment that we had was just incredible. And we saw them um, playing with snakes and like like just as a pack interacting with each other. And I just I just remember like having this like sudden rush that like this is like something magical, like as if I was seeing a unicorn. Like I'd never seen this creature before and I'm a big fan of dogs in general. So like this it was just such an incredible experience. I was working at a preschool, um, but there was just something about this animal or the species that just wouldn't get out of me kind of thing. Like I just was constantly thinking about them and asking questions. And so one day <laughs> it was a sponsored ad on Facebook and it came up that um, it was a pitch competition, the new pitch. And um, never heard of it, never done anything to do with filmmaking. Like, uh, but it was, you know, into your story um, on, to do with nature, environment or wildlife filmmaking and you can get go to the final round and you can pitch and then you can win uh, 50,000 rand to uh, create your short story. So I remember like it was about a, a week's worth of time where I was like, mm, mm, like, I, like should I do it, don't I do it? I have no idea about this. Like, um, So I went to my dad and I explained to him that like this, I wanna try to do this kind of thing. And like, this is the story I wanna tell. Like no one knows about these animals. There's like 500 left, like we need to do it. And um, so I sent off my proposal and I remember like, I just, uh, to be honest, I completely forgot about it and I thought that nothing was going to come from it and I left it and I remember I was once having a nap in the afternoon and I got a phone call and it was Noel from um, New and I just remember, like I remember being completely shocked and he was saying like, you've made it, like you're one of the pitch finalists and I was like, it's not, like it's, I remember like stopping and looking at the number to make sure it like, was a legit number and everything. And Noel being Noel just like cracked up laughing and was like, we'll see you soon kind of thing. And from there, the ball started rolling. It was first, the first hurdle was public speaking and pitching. <laughs> like it was one thing making a pretty proposal and convincing people with words, but to now pitch in front of like a room of people from Jackson Wild and from Nat Geo, it's extremely intimidating. Um, so that was the first hurdle. <laughs> But um, it was actually such an amazing experience and um, I actually won the audience award for my pitch, which was such a huge surprise. From my understanding of what I've seen, um, especially with South Africa's dogs and uh, in particular Mphilozi and Shishlui's dogs, the bloodlines are getting so strong and so good that they are now being dispersed to other areas and other countries and stuff to try to get the numbers up there. So there is definitely improvement happening and I think they've got the right people in the right roles doing the right things. I love my job and I love producing and I would never change the career path, but there's something that while making part of the pack, I just got a taste of the conservation and wildlife world and it's definitely where I want to end up. At the moment, I'm busy transitioning into seeing what opportunities might, there might be that open to that. But I've since literally the second the film was edited, I was like, okay, this needs to be a feature. So at the moment, I've got a feature proposal. It's just at the moment, um, finding the right funders and applying for it. Um, so I've just applied to a really cool film grant called the Durban Film Art in Durban. And um, so holding thumbs at that hopefully brings something. But I think I've sort of convinced myself that in the next like three years, I want to say, if I don't have the funding, I'm just going to find a way to do it uh, without it kind of thing. Like I've got enough footage in that it was more um, wanting to spend the time with the communities telling those stories and finding there were more individuals that I wanted to interview and involve, like vets and more um, hands-on people that are involved in the process.
Thanks for joining us again for Seeker Indie, our new short documentary Spotlight series. We're excited to keep bringing you stories from science you may have never heard before. Keep coming back to see what else we have in store and the amazing stories we continue to highlight. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Seeker.